So Michelle's studies fit into a larger framework for thinking about how to overcome temptation. One which, you'll not be surprised to hear, is articulated, as is almost everything that we're thinking about in this course, in one of the two great founding narratives of the Western literary tradition, in this case, Homer's Odyssey. Odysseus, pictured here in elegant white tunic, is trying to get home from the Trojan War. He's trying to get back to his wife, who is waiting faithfully for him at home, and it's taking him about 20 years to do so. And along the way, as he tries to go home, he faces all sorts of temptations which threaten to divert him from his path. And the temptation that he faces in this picture, illustrated here in the form of these beautiful flying women, who look to me a little bit like Dementors from Harry Potter. <laughs> he, however, finds them enormously tempting and is trying to figure out how to get the ship past the sirens, whose songs threaten to uh, cause the ship to founder upon the shoal so that he can get home to Penelope. And what he comes up with are two different strategies. The first strategy he applies to his sailors. You will see that around the ears of each of them is cotton batting. He blocks their ears so that the apparent utility of the sirens is reduced for them. Unable to hear their song, the sailors are able to continue rowing the boat past their source of temptation. What he does to himself, as you can see, is he has himself at point A on the Ainsley curve, lashed to the mast, because like Michelle's children and like Ainsley, he recognizes that when the siren's song is available to him directly, he will be in that B state where the smaller sooner reward, like turning off your alarm clock or eating that cupcake, looms larger to him. So what Odysseus does is he ties himself to the mast. Even though the temptation of the reward is evident to him, he has rendered himself unable to act on that temptation. And there is a tradition in the contemporary decision theory literature to use this metaphor of Ulysses and the sirens, Odysseus and the sirens, depending which translation you use of the name, to think about strategies for self-regulation. And it turns out that it's helpful, I think, to think about these strategies as falling into three categories. If you're trying to get past a temptation, that has the structure that we've been looking at in this class, a smaller, sooner reward that, because of temporal discounting, looms disproportionately large in your decision structure. One way to get around it is by means of external constraints. You can separate yourself from the ability to act on the temptation, right? You can turn off the internet on your computer. You can use one of those cell phone condoms. You can render yourself unable to act on the basis of that which is going to distract you from your path. You can put your alarm clock all the way across the room. You can take the cupcakes out of your house. You can put your credit card in a glass of water in the freezer. All of these are ways of separating yourself from the ability to act on the temptation. Or you can separate yourself from the appeal of the temptation in some way. You can reduce its subjective utility to you by, for example, blocking your ears. So you won't even notice that the temptation is there. So that's a way of externalizing responsibility for decision making in this case. And it's an extraordinarily effective way of self-regulating. 
You are an agent in the world. The actions which you're going to perform are actions on the world. And separating yourself from the ability to perform those actions is one way to get around temptation. A second way to get around temptation, which we've discussed a lot in the last two classes, is by direct appeal to the spirited or appetitive parts of your soul. So you can manipulate incentive structures for yourself. You can make things, change the relative utilities of the various rewards. You can subject yourself to interpersonal pressures. Remember, we put the smiley faces on your computer so that the gaze of the eyes of others would help you stick to your tasks. Or you can cultivate habits, right? You can get spirit and appetite into line with reason by cultivating natural ways of responding to things. But the third way that you can get around temptations is the one which we haven't discussed yet. And that is by means of reason. And it is in this light that Nozick discusses the roles that principles can play in allowing us not to be incontinent. 